So our next speaker um, I'm pleased to introduce is Professor Wynne Evans from the University of Cambridge, who will talk about the Gaia sausage, the head-on merger that battered our galaxy. Wynne. Thank you. So I shall be talking about achievements of the Gaia satellite, uh, which is a European Space Agency satellite uh, launched in December 2013, it's a scanning satellite that repeatedly monitors parts of the sky, recording positions of stars. And there was a revolutionary data release, data release two, less than a year ago. <coughs> so that data release <laughs> is the richest stellar catalog to date, and it contains a huge variety of data for stars, particularly stars in our galaxy, and of course, for other celestial objects. And in raw numbers, there are over a billion sources with positions and brightnesses, over a billion sources with parallaxes or distances, and proper motions or transverse velocities on the sky. Um, because the radial velocity spectrometer has a brighter limiting magnitude, there are less sources with uh, radial velocities, only of the order of 7 million or so. And so to obtain full phase space information, that is three positions and three velocities, we will often want to cross-match the Gaia data with spectroscopic surveys. So before I begin our main meal, which is, of course, of sausages, let me tantalize you with two bambouches, two little things that are magnificent that Gaia has already done. So from these catalogues, it's possible to select objects with no proper motion and no parallax, cross-match with WISE, the infrared satellite, and select quasars. You can select very pure samples of quasars, and you can cross-match the satellites, the, the, the quasar catalogs with themselves to find gravitational lensing. And so Gaia has been discovering a gravitational lens once every few days since the data release, data release two. And that's an astonishing statistic. Gaia has actually discovered more gravitational lenses in under a year than anyone else has managed over the preceding three decades. Here are some of the gravitational lensing. Um, I appreciate you can't see them in detail because there are so many, but the blue objects are quasars, and the red objects are galaxies, and the foreground galaxy is multiply imaging the background quasar. And what an astonishing achievement for a satellite that was sold as a galaxy satellite, a satellite to understand the formation of our own galaxy. And here's another bon bouche that was discovered, and it was plotted directly from the data. The data is publicly available. Anyone could have made this plot. It is a plot of the Gaia snail. <laughs> so what is plotted here? Well, we're looking at stars in our own galaxy, predominantly disk stars, nearby stars, and we're simply plotting height above or below the galactic plane versus vertical velocity, and the stars are color-coded according to their round and round motion, their azimuthal motion, and we see a snail. And what produces this snail? So the snail is produced because there is a correlation between the amplitude of motion of these stars, their vertical frequency, and their angular momentum. Just like tiggers, which are built from springs, so stars in the galactic disk are built of springs, and when something goes through the galactic disk, the stars respond, and the pattern that we see is a Gaia snail. But the main dish is the Gaia sausage. So the Gaia sausage is a structure in the stellar halo of our own galaxy. 
So here is our galaxy, and it's surrounded by tenuous stellar material, the stellar halo of the galaxy. Here, it's a big black ink blot. And we're interested in this component of the galaxy. We're interested in its mass and its shape and its clumpiness because it was built up from the accretion of many smaller objects. <coughs> the accretion history of our galaxy, we would like to know, because it tells us about the dark matter particle and the coupling of baryons to dark matter, and therefore it is concerned with fundamental problems regarding the first stars and the first galaxies and the nature of gravity itself. So let's think a little bit about stars in the stellar halo of our galaxy. Clearly, they have a position with respect to the center of the galaxy, an X, Y, Z. And so I could plot the locations of stars in position space. But there are also three velocity components. And thanks to Gaia, I now know these three velocity components. So I can also imagine plotting stars in velocity space, for example, in VR or V theta, where R and theta are components of velocity resolved with regard to spherical polar coordinates. And there's a fundamental parameter called the anisotropy parameter, or theta. And it is defined thus, 1 minus the sum of the squares of the dispersion in the tangential direction divided by twice the square of the radial velocity dispersion. So if the stars are isotropic, they're moving every which way, then sigma theta squared plus sigma thi squared will be equal to sigma r squared, and beta will be 1 minus 1. It will be 0. Whereas if the stars are mainly moving on eccentric orbits, then beta will be larger than 0, and if they're mainly moving on tangential or circular orbits, then beta will be less than 0. So now let's suppose I'm looking at an isotropic distribution of stars, and I plot it up in velocity space. I see a, a sphere, a meatball. Now let's suppose that I have a distribution of stars that is tangentially an isotropic. So there's more motion in the angular directions, v theta and v thi, than v r. And so the shape in velocity space is now that of a burger. Uh, v theta and V thi are long axes, and Vr is a short axis. And of course, to get to a sausage, what I need is a highly radially anisotropic distribution of stars, lots of stars moving on radial orbits, so I have a long axis in the Vr direction, and then two short axes in the azimuthal direction. So the Gaia sausage is a sausage in velocity space. So let's take some data. We're going to cross-match Gaia with the SDSS spectroscopic survey so that I can not merely have proper motions, but also line of sight velocities, and therefore I have complete phase space information on the sky. In particular, this is the data, position on the sky, color and magnitude, proper motion, in RA and DEC from the Gaia satellite, line of sight velocity and metallicity from Sloan, and I can convert that to a galactic XYZ, a galactic VX, VY, and VZ, and a metallicity, and I can look at main sequence stars centered on the sun. So here's a plot of distribution of stars in velocity space. It's a rather busy plot. What is varying horizontally is stellar metallicity from low to high. And what is varying vertically is the height above the galactic disk from low to high. And just by picturing this, we can see that there are meatballs and there are sausages. 
So let's look at two of those plots in a bit more detail. Here the stars are really rather metal poor. They're metal poor constituents of the stellar halo. And we see that their velocity distribution is round and isotropic. So they were probably built up from lots of small galaxies merging a long, long time ago. And those stars have had their velocity distribution isotropized. Now let's move to slightly more metal-rich stars, still very metal-poor, much more metal-poor than stars in the galactic disk. And now we see a sausage, a clear sausage. There is some contamination from the disk because this is an azimuthal velocity of about 200. But the comparatively more metal-rich stars in the stellar halo form a sausage. And we can plot this up and make it still more striking by looking at the um, anisotropy parameter versus metallicity. And we see exactly what I've just shown you, that as we move from really rather metal poor stars, the anisotropy parameter is close to zero, so they're roughly isotropic. As we move to the more metal rich stars in the halo, there is a strong jump in the anisotropy parameter. This is a very extreme value of the anisotropy parameter because beta equals one means the stars are moving on radial orbits. The left-hand plot shows the same thing, but with regard to the three components of the um, velocity dispersion tensor. So how on earth does one produce such an extreme distribution of velocities. How do you get all these stars to line up so they're moving on almost exactly radial orbits? Well, there's only one real way to do this, and that's to take one big thing that came in on a very radial orbit. It has to be a big clunker because it's producing most of the stars in this metallicity range and it has to be moving on almost head-on collision to provide the extreme radial anisotropy. And so that is the Gaia sausage. We can see the same thing in a rather more theoretical plot. So here I've plotted uh, actions, so they're widely used in galactic astronomy because they're adiabatic invariants. And these are rather busy plots, but you're looking at the principal planes in action space. And these are prograde and retrograde stars. This is the azimuthal action, or angular momentum, plotted against the radial action. And it's been done for a metal-rich and a metal-poor section of the paper of the halo. And in this paper, we've subtracted the difference. So where you see red stars, that is the metal-rich halo, the sausage. And you see they're all bunched around zero angular momentum. These are radial orbits. And they're all of very high eccentricity. So, the data betray the evidence of a head-on collision between the Milky Way galaxy and another galaxy, uh, the Sausage Galaxy, about 8 to 10 billion years ago. And the evidence comes from studies of the stellar halo stars in velocity space and in action space as a function of metallicity. And this is a calculation we could only do subsequent to Gaia Data Release 2, because only Gaia Data Release 2 provided us with sufficiently accurate proper motions or tangential velocities for us to figure out that these orbits were so radial. And this is an artist's impression of what happened from the press release a long, long time ago, eight billion years ago. The Sausage Galaxy merged with the Nascent Milky Way Galaxy. We can go a little bit further. We can be a bit more quantitative going to simulations of the formation of the Milky Way galaxy. So a suite of simulations made largely in Durham called the Auriga simulations. And for these simulations, we can perform the self-same calculation, decomposing stars in the stellar halo into different velocity distributions. And we can see if we can match what we think is in the data. So in the data, we see strong radial anisotropy so we're looking for simulations where beta 
is about 0.9 to 1, and the contribution of these stars to the stellar halo is between 60 to 100 percent. So we're looking for simulations of the buildup of structure in these suite of Milky Ways that lie within that box. And indeed, we do sign some. They are indeed simulations where there has been an unusually late radial or head-on merger. The plot on the left shows the accretion history of these simulations, red and blue, averaged over the ensemble versus time. Perhaps slightly more insightful are the next two plots, which tell us really what we'd like to know. So the, uh, the red filled circles that look like pool balls, they're the ones that we believe are closest to the Milky Way in this suite of simulations, and we can see that they typically correspond to Milky Ways in which there was a collision with a progenitor of the order of 10 to the 9 or so stars in stellar mass, much more, of course, in dark matter, because the dark matter mass-to-light ratio is going to be of the order of 10 to 100. And we can also get an approximate estimate of the merger time between 6 and 8 billion years ago. We can look for further evidence, so an obvious thing to do is this. If this hypothesis is right, it was a big galaxy that merged, bigger than the Sagittarius galaxy. We know that there are globular clusters in the Milky Way associated with the Sagittarius galaxy, so we can look for globular clusters that were associated with the Sausage galaxy. We can look for globular clusters and these are plots of globular clusters, old halo, young halo, Sagittarius, bulge, unidentified. We can look for globular clusters that are extremely eccentric. And so this is a plot of pericenter versus apocenter of the colored globular clusters. And we're looking at lines of constant eccentricity. These are the circular orbits all the way down to the highly eccentric orbits. And we can indeed see a bunch of globular clusters that are on highly eccentric orbits. These are the sausage globular clusters. And, and this is important, they also form a track in the age metallicity plane, distinct from the bulk of the Milky Way globular clusters, suggesting that they had indeed been accreted. We can look at a tracer of the sausage. So an obvious tracer is the Aralira distribution and we can pull the Aralyras directly out of the Gaia catalog and look at their three-dimensional distribution. So here it is shown what the three-dimensional distribution is. And indeed, we see a triaxial structure, a sausage in configuration space, as well as a sausage in velocity space, that is the first viewing of the Gaia sausage. We can also see um, over densities in this structure which are naturally associated with a big thing coming in, turning round, and then under dynamical friction swinging back and forth. So what are the consequences of this, just very quickly? If the stellar halo is bimodal, then so must the dark halo be bimodal. There must have been a slew of dark matter that was brought in with the Sausage Galaxy. And that has direct implications for detection experiments looking for dark matter on the Earth. So for example, this is a directional detection experiment. We're looking at a dark matter particle colliding with a nucleus, and the nucleus is recoiled. And analogous to cloud chamber experiments, you can measure the direction of the recoil. And that, of course, is very sensitive to the nature of the velocity distribution of the dark matter particles. So the sausage gives you a characteristic signature in such experiments. And then another thing you can do is look at dark matter self-annihilation. So if the dark matter particle is a neutralino, it will self-annihilate to gamma rays, and you will get a caustic in, the, in a galaxy corresponding to the location of the pericenters of the dark matter particles that were brought in by the sausage. So there are lots of outstanding questions because Gaia is changing the rules in galactic astronomy. What would we like to know? We'd like to know, is this merger responsible for the creation of the galactic disk? If there was a pre-existing disk, what happened when this big object came in? 
How much dark matter has this event contributed? Did the progenitor also bring in an entourage of smaller satellites? If the large Magellanic Cloud fell into the galaxy, we know there is a smaller galaxy that orbits the large Magellanic Cloud. And if this was a galaxy as big as I said, it too would have a black hole in the center. And so it would have brought a black hole into the Milky Way galaxy. And when did it merge with the Milky Way's black hole? So here are some sausage mania papers for you to pursue this. And let me leave you with one last thought. It was the 25th of April, 2018, that Gaia DR2 was provided to everyone. The first data release was comparatively puny. But the second data release was a revolutionary moment. <laughs> Thank you. OK, open for questions on sausages. No? Yes, John. <clears throat> uh, thank you. That was a fantastic advert for Gaia. Um, looking ahead, I, I believe data release three, if not imminent, is at least in, in, in the calendar. Um, and I wonder, you know, what we might be looking forward to in that. Is it a matter of uh, expanding on these already incredible numbers, or will there be a, a, a qualitative uh, further quantum leap? So, so that's, a, that's a good question. I think for single stars, I think the revolutionary moment was the 25th of April 2018. But for variable stars and double stars and binaries, that revolutionary moment is yet to come. Because data release three that will provide us with, with those riches. So I agree, the revolution needs itself to get another revolution. Okay, other questions? Right. I think you've satisfied people's appetite for sausages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wynn, thank, thank you, you very, very much indeed. Thank you.